acoustic horizon experience. Then the switch is pretty easy because then you say, okay, now I'm feeling the acoustic horizon pulling or shrinking or compressing. So let me practice listening to that as a kind of advancing of another thing, another mm -hmm. force. Like if I really can feel this as a physical sort of, you know, then so connected, you sort of feel that, that expansion. Is it connected to the sounds that are getting masked by more dominant sounds? In my experience, the, the, the uh, stepping through it that I've done has been this thing about the masking by more dominant sounds. In other words, they're farther acoustically. But then there's also the sounds that have already passed. And then the most interesting to me are the sounds that haven't happened yet. <laughs> So we did a, a project in Romania that was two weeks that was like a kind of anticipatory listening, <laughs> listening for the sounds that haven't happened yet. And so we were reading my mother Stells, who talks about the radical imagination, which is where you can not just imagine a world that doesn't exist, but actually feel it present. Like how can you feel and imagine a reality that's not yet there, you know? And so like we were trying to listen for sounds that haven't happened yet, which was like really complicated weird and intense, but I don't know, am I imagining it, like, really listening, you know? And people are bringing examples of like, okay, you know, you work in a factory, there's the sound, or in the school, there's the sound of the bell, you know? You're often listening for it. You're listening, waiting for it to happen, and there's this kind of urgency and intensity to this anticipatory listening, you know? So there's, there's ways to find like practical examples from your life, but then really practice it like, how do we listen to, to a horizon of silence, or for a horizon of silence? And for that particular dimension of it, that is like uh, the time that hasn't happened yet, or the sound that hasn't happened yet. But that's a whole like, so this, you know. This, this concept, does it also come from Barry Truex? Is it, is the, the acoustic, Truex? yeah, he, he, but see, he kind of skips over it very quickly, says so there's the acoustic horizon, and it's this thing, and it's a field, and it situates you, and so forth. Oh. Who? Um, Truex. Truex. Yeah. Um, and then corresponding to this, because it makes sense, because he's a philosopher ultimately. This is sort of phenomenology that goes through language. It makes sense if you have silence, do you have sound, do you have silence, right? And so, so there's this sort of way of explicating this idea. But to actually follow it experientially, and then to sort of like see like how does that have anything to do with the production of our lives and our relationships and being in the world? Theology and how we change our perception of ourselves, then it's just like, well, I have to actually like get together with people and say, okay, do we really get this concept? What would it be? Like, can we freaking actually, if, if there is such a theoretical thing as the horizon of silence, can you listen for it? Not hear it. I know I can't hear it. I'm not, you know, I can pretend to hear it. I can drink and hear it, you know, but can I actually listen for it, which is not the same thing as hearing. And the, the, the search for it is actually a listening. I mean, the more you try, the more you realize you're actually doing it, right? Uh, and so, and so <laughs> but it can also people, be goofy. Did other people pick up, pick on? It takes, that? in my experience, it takes a little bit. No, I mean um, uh, other, like, writers. Or is it just, uh, maybe, I'm sure. I would sure. like to, like, I would like I'm to sure. about that. I'm sure <laughs> there has been a lot of discourse around it. My, my curiosity is about the relationship between discourse and physical. Like Jean Luc Nancy wrote this beautiful book about listening, you know. But he's a philosopher, I suppose. He can the subject of listening. What book is that? On listening. On what's called on listening. Or listening. On listening. Oh. I forget how it's translated. This. Can the subject listen? This is a, listening is unintentional, unintentional. And he's sort of this beautiful way of unpacking it through language, which then creates this metaphor and images in our minds. But I don't think he's talking about listening. I think he's talking about language about listening, and ideas <laughs> about listening, <laughs> and philosophies of listening. But like when I start to actually engage with it as a practitioner who's always moving stuff through my body at that ultimate, even though I read also, you know, I just like it's not always the same. Talking about it and engaging with it as a phenomenon that is sensorial are related, but they're not always the same. You know, and some things that make a lot of sense sensorially are hard to verbalize, and things that you can verbalize in beautiful ways are like sensorially, no, you know, that's actually not available. So I'm interested in the relationship between the two. I thought it sort of, sort of related, like, interesting um, to note, like, a, a lot of these French uh, 
thinkers. Um, like, I, I see it as, you know, there, it's often the examples in terms of praxis, you know, are, are very much like, I mean, for, for Nancy, it's like he, he refers to Jean-Claude Risset, who is like, you know, cool at one point in the kind of like dorky computer music world. Mm -hmm. And like, I think he refers to um, Grisset, like French spectralist composer, and Wagner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, you know, so like, Nancy doesn't have a clue what people like you. Nancy, I don't think Nancy listens much. You don't have to know what I do. I don't think he sits around and listens to stuff, you know? I think he theorizes about certain modes of attention and modes of subjectivity. I think it's, when he says, can the subject listen, in my mind, he's asking about the subject. He's not asking about listening. Mm. The, the, the direction of that question is always towards the subject, towards the subject. Whereas somebody like Lefebvre is always towards the pro production of listening as a kind of socially constructed way of knowing. Not about the subject. Don't care about the subject. Could, the subject makes no sense, you know, to live that because it's all intersubjective and we're all free in each other all the time. So I'm more interested in like I'm interested in the relation between the two. And I'm not a philosopher. I can't deal with the whole subject question. It never makes any sense to me. So Nancy is a beautiful read to me, but I don't understand what he's talking about at the end of the day. Well, at the end of the day, it's just like this does not correspond to my experience of being in the world. I understand all your words. But my experience of being in the world is so at odds with this uh, this kind of understanding. I mean, I, I was going to say though, like um, what you were talking about um, from the beginning with this kind of sensing mm -hmm. seemed to me to be very unseen in the in this in the way of like um, there seems to be an interest in like bringing back a certain sensual or mm -hmm. like, you know, within the Western philosophical tradition. I don't, I mean, I'm totally a dilettante and it's mm -hmm. kind of philosophy shit myself. I think it's why I would relate more to Melville Bonti than Nancy. I relate more to somebody like Sully Brahmi. Yeah, Sully Brahmi, who's a Brazilian point, think he's brilliant and has done a lot of work around Western philosophy and Western sort of notion of how even our senses are actually a, a mode of knowledge that we produce together. They're not, like my sense of seeing is not mine, it's ours, it's constructed collectively, mm -hmm. you know? And, but how profound, how profoundly registered it being inside the body it is, you know? And so to me, and Suli Ramlik is looking at art. Suli Ramlik is saying that social practices in art Forms of cooperation in art, forms of experimentation with the self in art, are teaching us something. And what they're teaching us is that we've, um, at least that's my sense of what he's saying, is that is that we've been ignoring in the dominant culture, we've been ignoring the entire universes, like the knowledge production that art is absorbing. And then he has a particular model of what kind of sensor, which I don't understand. But anyway, it's like he goes kind of far with that. Um, but what I what I find interesting about him is that he looks at he doesn't have a theory that he then exemplifies with art, which I think is what Nancy does. He just really looks at artists and says, how does this unsettle a philosophical understanding of a subject? It really is showing us that there's this other effort and desire and and exploration that I'm now going to try to theorize with the language of. Uh, and I've seen that like over the duration of his writing happen. It's really exciting. Because um, usually it's the other way. There's a discourse or a sort of theory, and then there's the artist that are kind of somehow really good examples of it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the way things go. But of course, art structures so much of you know, it. Seems like it's, uh, so uh, yeah, I would re I would really point to another Bunti, which is more of the phenomenology of doing. But it's still philosophy, which I still ultimately profoundly don't get, like at a fundamental level. <laughs> so, you know, Seth Kim Cohen has some interesting critiques of phenomenology in his book. Mm -hmm. I've, I've started reading it. I haven't come to it. It's, I mean, uh, 
I'm, I'm sort of tempted to not, or I don't know, um, to, to be a little hesitant to, to like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do a lot of work that sort of attempts a kind of phenomenological listening that, you know, is then the, the, the attempt is to connect it directly with language. So, like, people transcribe, well, they, they, they transcribe what happens in, in, in the concert hall or okay. in the concert experience, which is just silence often. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, the, the idea is to get them in, into this mode where they're just like, describing like raw acoustic sound mm -hmm. but like what does that mean like can you actually can you can you like as it were block out this you know like uh, um, politically socially ethically determined stimuli you know right. like and um, I guess Chris has a piece also that sort of revolves around similar yeah. problems. And it's interesting because it's, um, it takes away the embodiment. So what people are doing in this project, which actually Doug um, participated in, it's actually, it's open. Yeah, sorry, it's because I'm, <laughs> I'll take this off. <laughs> um, what, yeah, it's a project that Doug actually participated in, and it's actually open to anybody because it's going on to the end of October. But um, so it's very similar to what we've been doing in, in a way, but the parameters are totally open. But the thing is, you're listening to a space that you're not in. And you're listening, and similar to what Doug has been doing, it's, it's the task is to describe, so you're trying to turn it into language. Mm -hmm. um, and that description is streamed back into the space where, that you're listening to, so that a person that's in the space can listen to somebody elsewhere your Describe, yeah, yeah, try yeah. to translation description yeah. of what yeah. they think is happening. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting the relation between, you know, perceptual apparatus and the, yeah. and the body. And the and body. The so it's taking the body. Yeah. The body is not there. Yeah. And, and it, well, well, in a way it's there. In a, in a way, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that I'm interested in is like how, because the thing, the, the, the piece is about presence, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's like how, how, is it possible to be present without a body, for instance? Or some of the things, but... Well, the, um, the Lefebvre stuff that you were mentioning, was one of Lefebvre's um, triadic or trialectics of space, is um, he has several different systems. And one of them is kind of borrows the language of phenomenology to, to get at this. Um, and it's like perceived space. So if we're to think of the space of the body, how is the body space right now? Perceived space would be the space of the sensorial apparatus or the perceptual apparatus. And how it works and how it like operates. Conceived space, which is in the terms of like the space of the body would be all of our learned understandings of the body. What is gendered body, what is uh, how does it work at anatomy, represent aesthetic representations of the body, all of them. So the learned or conceptualized body. And then he has a third one that's called the lived space or the lived body, which is bizarre because it is, and then when you, the more you look at it, the more like, oh, I can't separate them, yeah. right? Because each one is already assumes that the others are in place. Neither is the primary one, right. you know? But the lived one is like, of course it's also perceived, in, but there's this excess, and he's sort of, one of the examples is like, when you, when your skin crawls at something, when you're disgusted by something, by your own pubes in the, in the, in the tub, right? That that's, that that's sort of immediately shows these three things working together. That there's this thing about you perceptually seeing it, you're connecting it to known um, cultural and ideological representations of what a body is, but there's this third thing, which is the action of the body of doing something with that and of being a lived, both mythologized but also physical thing. It's like that's the third space of the body, you know? And it's like, oh. And so you, you can only see them as working together. You can't see them as working separately. Or he would say, like, what is the space of a home? Or what is the space of a nation? Or what is that? And it's sort of the space of X is a production process that is continuous and that has these three interlinked moments. Each one of these moments presupposes and influences the other two. One is the 
sort of perceived, one is the conceived, and one is the lived. That's how space happens. That's his theory. And it's kind of like an interesting 